Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, tonight I will be reading around two pages from Surah Al Ahzab. If you want to follow along, it's starting from Ayah 16 until Ayah 31. Inshallah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لن ينفعكم الفرار إن فررتم من الموت أو القتل وإذا لا تمتعون إلا قليلا قل من ذا الذي يعصمكم من الله إن أراد بكم سوءا أو أراد بكم رحمة ولا يجدون لهم من دون الله وليا ولا نصيرا قد يعلم الله المعوقين منكم والقائلين لإخوانهم هلم إلينا ولا يأتون البأس إلا قليلا أشحة عليكم فإذا جاء الخوف فإذا جاء الخوف رأيتهم ينظرون إليك تدور أعينهم كالذي يغشى عليه من الموت فإذا ذهب الخوف سلقوكم بألسنة حداد أشحة على الخير أولئك لم يؤمنوا فأحبط الله أعمالهم وكان ذلك على الله يسيرا يحسبون الأحزاب لم يذهبوا وإن يأتي الأحزاب يودوا لو أنهم بادون في الأعراب يسألون عن أنبائكم ولو كانوا فيكم ما قاتلوا إلا قليلا لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا وتسليما من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا ليجزي الله الصادقين بصدقهم ويعذب المنافقين إن شاء أو يتوب عليهم إن الله كان غفورا رحيما ورد الله الذين كفروا بغيظهم لم ينالوا خيرا وكفى الله المؤمنين القتال وكان الله قويا عزيزا وأنزل الذين ظاهروهم من أهل الكتاب من صياصيهم وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب 
وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب فريقا تقتلون وتأسرون فريقا وأورثكم أرضهم وديارهم وأموالهم وأرضا لم تطؤوها وكان الله على كل شيء قديرا يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك إن كنتن تردن الحياة الدنيا وزينتها فتعالين فتعالين أمتعكن وأسرحكن سراحا جميلا وإن كنتن تردن الله ورسوله والدار الآخرة فإن الله أعد للمحسنات منكن أجرا عظيما يا نساء النبي من يأت منكن بفاحشة مبينة يضعف لها العذاب ضعفين وكان ذلك على الله يسيرا ومن يقنت منكن لله ورسوله ومن يقنت منكن لله ورسوله وتعم ورسوله ومن يقنت منكن لله ورسوله وتعمل صالحا نؤتها أجرها مرتين وكان ذا وأعتدنا لها رزقا كريما صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات I believe he deserves a louder salawat. Salaamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullah. As you all know, tonight is the last session. And inshallah, we will get the reward from Fatimah al Zahra. Salaamu Alaikum. Taqabbal Allah Amalakum. You know that the operation of the masjid is always cost for us and we welcome your donation. We really appreciate it and the masjid needs your help. There is a ziyara actually, the trip ziyara to the Karbala shrine of Imam Hussein, Agha Amir al muminin Iraq and Iran on December 20th to January 4th. And the Imam of the Center, Hazrat Hujat al-Islam wal Muslimin, Dr. Ghazbini, will be there with them. And Mr. Ali Asadi register you, and he will be the leader of the caravan. If you want to just register, please call him. And the flyer is on a hallway. You can see that. Please remember all the ill people, people especially Mahmoud Reza, his mother, just called me personally, and he requested to pray for him tonight. Please remember all, inshallah. Without any further ado, I will invite the Imam of the Center to the podium with a loud salawat. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والضحا واللیل اذا سجا ما ودعك ربك وما قلا وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to create mankind, He also decided to guide them. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى Glorify the name of your Lord, the High, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى Who created and fashioned. الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ And the one who measured out, measured out, قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى And guided. Guidance comes with a creation. Because without guidance, there is no point in the creation without guidance. There would be no difference between human beings and animals if there is no guidance. You don't send your son to a school if he's not learning in that school. If he's not benefiting from that school, you are not going to send him there. God is not going to send us to, to this earth if he does not have a program for us to guide us. Pharaoh asked Musa السلام, and his brother Harun, what is the identity? What is the identity of your Lord? Tell me about your Lord. Our Lord is the one who shaped everything in a creation, shaped them in a creation, then guided them, then guided them immediately. Without, with, with the creation comes guidance. We don't see an airplane being built without a radar system, without a navigation system. That airplane would not have any destination. It would not reach anywhere without a navigation system. We need a navigation system in this land. And this navigation system is called Hidayah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided through His kindness, through His wisdom, through His love and affection to guide us. Muslim theologians and philosophers call this a process, they call it Qa'idatul Lutf, the maxim of kindness. Out of His kindness, he wants to teach us, to guide us, to save us. He wants us. He wants us to reach our final destination safe and sound. And the final destination is the hereafter. He wants us. He eagerly wants us to reach that destination. Therefore, He will provide everything for us to be guided in this life. Not to be confused, not to be lost. If we surrender to Him, we see the way. But if we rebel, we are not going to see the path. There are two types of people in this life. Mankind is divided into two groups. One group are the prophets and the messengers and the imams. Those are universal leaders. The other group is us, me and you, the common people. who have to be guided. who have to follow those messengers. For the messengers and the prophets and the imams... God designated something called isma, protection, moral protection, religious protection, mental prote protection, 
spiritual protection, impeccability, infallibility, faultlessness. For us, the common people, God provided guidance, Hidayah. As to the first one, the Isma, many people say, I have a problem with this concept of Isma. How can a human being full of desires, full of earthly and worldly and lower desires, how can that person, that human being, control himself or herself against these desires? We have desire to love money. وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا jamma. This is a fact. God who fashioned us, he's telling us, I fashioned you, I know about your heart and your thoughts and your desires. What to hibbun and you love wealth, mal, wealth with an abundance, with an excessive, excessive way of love. Not just love, excessively. What to hibbun al mal hubban jamma. We have desire to the opposite sex. A man has desire for women, a woman has desire for men. We have desire for children, to have family, to have children, to have kids. We have desire to, to have a friend. We also have desire to break the law. To break the law. People are not just civilized because of their education, because of the fear of God. People are civilized, civilized. When I came to this country, something caught my attention the first day. On the freeway, I see on the billboard, there is $1,000 penalty for littering. This is why, re relatively speaking, the roads are clean. Not like, you know, our country where people, they toss the trash outside because there is no penalty there. But when there is a penalty, heavy penalty, $1,000 penalty, people for the fear of penalty, not because they, they, are, they are, you know, angels, behaving like angels. No, for the fear of penalty. They don't break the law. If this law is removed, you will see what happens the following day. If there is no speeding ticket, nobody is going to drive at 65 miles per hour including your imam. I'd like to fly on the freeway. So for the fear of the penalty, we follow the law. The majority of the people, majority of the people, the fear of penalty. There are a few people who have conscience. They don't care whether there's the, there is law or there is no law. They protect the society. They protect themselves. They fear God. They know about the consequences. But those people are very few. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know about your desires. Those people who do not believe in the isma, many Muslims and many non-Muslims, even within Islam, there are some schools of thought who say there is no concept. There is no such concept called isma, faultlessness. We are human. We have desires. They don't accept it. Whereas Isma is embedded in this book, in the Holy Quran, in many chapters, in many verses. And the simple meaning of Isma, infallibility, the simple meaning of it is that God has designated some leaders. He chose them. He chose them. In Allah Astafa, not us. We did not choose. He chose them. He selected them. In Allah Astafa, Adam wa Nuhan wa Ala Ibrahim wa Ala Imran ala al alameen those leaders do not just deliver the message, they practice it themselves. They are role model, they are example, they are mentors, they are teachers, they are source of inspiration for us. We follow them, we look at them and we follow their example. Not just delivering the message. And therefore, if they are supposed to be role models, they have to be clean. They have to present good example. And isma means, isma means that they have the seeds of goodness in them. <coughs> they have good seeds. They have the basic layer of a protection. They have a strong immune system. 
They have a stronger immune system than us. Spiritual and moral immune system, not physical. They have a stronger immune, stronger immune system. And when they have this basic seeds in them, God is going to bestow on them an extra layer of protection and immunity. Extra layer. Meaning that they have the freedom to commit sin and they do have desire just like us. The desire is not being compromised. The desire is not taken away from them. They have all sorts of desires inside them. But have, they have a stronger system of control over these desires. This is the difference between them and us. We don't have a strong system of control. They do have. They do have. And that stage is called, that stage of immunity is called yaqeen. Yaqeen, certainty. They have no doubt that God is seeing them. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. God is watching. God is observing. God is seeing them for the love of God, not just fear, love, love. Let's use this, this term, love and reverence for God. Fear has negative connotation, but reverence has positive connotation. Reverence means you love God. You don't want to lose him. You can't afford losing him. This is why you don't upset him. You don't upset him and you do everything he wants you to do. He asks you to do. This is the meaning of Isma. Isma does not take away from them their freedom. It doesn't. Neither it takes away their desire. Isma provides them with extra layer of immunity and protection. Therefore, they have desire, but at the same time, they have a power of resistance to that desire. God said to the Prophet ﷺ in chapter 17, Surah Al-Isra, if it wouldn't have been that we thabbatnak, we strengthened your heart, your soul. We strengthened you, we supported you, thabbatnak, tathbeet, laqad kitta tarkanu ilayhim shay'an qalila. You would have inclined toward them a little bit. Inclined towards the disbelievers, non-believers. The polytheist, you would have compromised. You would have compromised your role. This is what God tells him in chapter 17. But because of tathbit, tathbit here means asma. You have an extra layer of protection. This is why you did not incline. You did not compromise. You did not give concession to Quraysh. Quraysh put so much pressure on you to give concession, to leave, to quit your work, to, to quit your role and your job. But you did not give concession to them because of tathbeet. And this tathbeet, my friends, strengthening you. You can have it, we can have it if you want. It's not only for the Anbiya. Allah says in this book, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا God strengthen the heart, the faith, those who truly believe in him in this life. We have to ask oh, Allah tathbeet always. Say, Ilahi, keep me on this path. Don't take me away. Don't let me experience a, weak, a, a moment of weakness in my life that I compromise my faith, my principles, my values, my honesty, my truth. I don't sell my faith. Some people started their this life on the right path, but then unfortunately they had to exit. They could not continue. There is so much pressure on them, so much intimidation on them. One of the things that I saw during my lifetime in this country and other countries, honorable, religious, dedicated ladies observing hijab for several years, for several decades, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. But then, because of the pressure and intimidation, they had to take it off. What is the meaning of hijab? What does hijab mean? Why God ask, 
politely asks women to observe hijab in his book in three different, three different chapters, three different verses. God speaks about hijab in this book. Surah An-Nur and Surah Al-Ahzab. Three, three places. Hijab is not a piece of a cloth that you take it out, you burn it, you throw it away. Hijab is commitment. Hijab is a declaration of faith. Hijab is your identity. Your identity. An expression of identity. Hijab is a statement. Statement of loyalty to God. Hijab is submission to God. Hijab, you send a powerful message to the people around you that I am not a piece of a flesh and a blood. Don't treat me as a flesh and a blood. Treat me as a human being. I'm not selling myself cheap. Don't focus on my physical side. Do not focus on the color of my skin. Do not focus on my, how I, my eyes look or my hair or my body part. Don't treat me like that. Treat me for who I am. Treat me for my character, for my faith, for my contribution, for my contribution to my society, for my role in my society. Don't focus on my body. Do not treat me just as a physical being. I'm a human being. I am more than a body. Look at my inner soul. This is the meaning of hijab. If we appreciate this meaning, nobody is going to burn hijab. But if we treat hijab as a piece of a cloth, they're going to burn it every single day because it has no value. Piece of a cloth, you put it today, you remove it tomorrow. But when it is a declaration of faith between you and God, you are not going to remove it. When it becomes part of your identity and your character and your value, nobody is going to remove it. Let's understand the meaning of hijab. When we ask our kids to observe hijab, many people, 90% of the Muslims, they say to them, wear the hijab, my sweetie, wear the hijab, because if you don't wear it, God is going to be angry. This is not the right way. There is so much pressure on her. She lives in America. She's being bullied in the school. This is not the right way. Don't speak about God's anger and God's punishment. Some people don't listen to you. Tell her. Tell her and tell men, first of all, tell men to respect women. Surah An-Nur begins by addressing men. Tell men to cast down their eyes. Men have to wear hijab too. We think hijab is only designated for women. Men have to wear hijab. You have to be conservative in your dress. How many times I've said here on this podium and other podiums, when you go to a mosque, when you go in public, whether a mosque or another place, no shorts for men, no shorts are allowed. Even if it is summer and hot, you have no right. You are a Muslim. There is a specific dress code in Islam, not just for women. We only focus on women and we forget about men. Men also have hijab. Take care of your dress. You have to wear conservative. You can't ask your wife to cover herself from head to toe while you are wearing a t-shirt or a short. Sometimes in the mosque. This is unacceptable. We have to be just. We can't expect our women to wear several layers and men are wearing nothing. As we see sometimes. So hijab for both, for men and for women. Let men cast their eyes, let them not judge women, and then we can encourage women. We tell them this is your identity, not a piece of a cloth. You have to be proud of it. And besides it's submission to your Lord. God sees you more beautiful in this address. You are making a statement. You are inviting people to Islam. You are telling people, people, I am not just flesh and blood. I have a brain. I have a soul. I have a character. I have a role. I have a contribution. Don't judge me for the way I look. Don't judge me for my character.
This is the meaning of hijab. So this is the first part, the part of isma. God bestows this extra layer on the prophets and the imams. So they are role model because if they, if a, a, a prophet or an imam behaves in a bad way, people are not going to trust him. Look at the Torah, my friends, the Torah. I was reading the Torah today in the morning. The book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, so many chapters that speak about the previous prophets. Begins with Adam. Begins with God first. Insults God. Even God is not, God is not perfect in the Torah. Even God is not perfect. God is walking in the in the Garden of Eden, according to the Torah, book of Genesis, chapter 3. Check it out tonight. Chapter 3. And then Adam and Eve, they hide, they hide behind the tree and God does not see them. What sort of God is this? Who does not see people walking next to him? He doesn't see. How can he see me here on earth? If he did not see Adam and Eve, he would be able to see me? What sort of God? He needs the glasses. This is God. So they hide and God does not see them. And when they eat from the tree, God is going to curse Eve. What sort of God who curses women? And he tells her, listen, Eve, I'm not going to forgive you for the rest of your life. You and your descendants, not just Eve, all women, including you guys. He's not going to, he's not going. And he says, one of the punishments I am going to, you know, uh, impose on you is what huh did you read the bible uh, the, the torah what punishment pregnancy and conception this is punishment god is punishing women we were supposed to get pregnant but because of eve you got it yourself so go and figure it out not only not only conception haml but also the birth is curse Curse on women. Can you see? What sort of God is this? Where is his mercy? Where is his wisdom? Where is his forgiveness? And then tells Adam, after he curses Eve, he comes to Adam. He says, Adam, I am going to send you to the earth. He says, ground, ground in the Bible, in the, in the Torah. But the ground means the earth. And that earth is going to be cursed because of you. So this entire earth is cursed. Because one person landed here on earth. Can you imagine? And then they go to, to Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh after they, he arrives, after the ships, his, his ships embarks, they uh, lands. He comes down and he creates a vineyard, plants, plants grapes. And then he harvests the grape, he makes wine, he himself. He makes wine. What sort of wine? I don't know. French wine, <laughs> American wine. And then he drinks, and it says in the Torah, my friends, this is chapter number nine. Read it. He drank. He became a drunk. Nuh becomes a drunk. And when he becomes a drunk, he started to behave in a bad way. So he takes off his clothes. He becomes, he becomes naked. This is Nabi. This is universal leader. For them, Isma does not. Does, has no meaning. And when he becomes naked, his son, his son, what is the name of his son? His son, Ham, he has three children, Ham, Sam, and Yafith. Their names are mentioned in the Torah. So his son, Ham, he goes and he finds his father naked, so he calls his brothers. He comes, he tells them, come, come and look at this X-rated movie. Look at our father. So they come and they watch the father. The father gets angry. So he takes off his anger on whom? Huh? No, 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 no. On Ham. And Ham later on became the father of the Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? The Arabs who are going to live in Palestine. And Nuh said, Oh God, send your curse on those Canaanites till the end of this life. This is why the, this is what the Torah say. Torah says that Palestinians are cursed. And he said, oh God, I want the children of Ham, this cursed boy, 
to be servants to Sam and Yafith. Sam is the grandfather of the Jews. And Ham is the gr great grandfather of the Palestinians. So the Palestinians, by the order of God and the curse of the Father, has to serve, have to serve the Jews for the end of their life. This is in the Torah, chapter 9. Check it out. And then comes to Ibrahim. Ibrahim was going to Egypt from Palestine on a trip. His wife, Sarah, was attractive and beautiful, according to the Torah. And then he said to her, listen, I'm going to meet Pharaoh. Don't tell Pharaoh you are my wife. Tell him you are my sister. Because if you tell him you are my wife, he's not going to touch you. But if you tell him I'm his sister, he's going to have desire for you. And I want him to have desire for you so he can give me some money. This is in the Torah, chapter 9. Read it. People don't know about these things. And then it comes to Lut. It says Lut was sleeping and he got drunk too. His two daughters decided, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa It shakes that the earth to sleep with the father. One of them said, I sleep with him tonight. Tomorrow you sleep with my father. This is in the Torah, the holy book. This is how they attribute these terrible, shameful acts to the universal messengers of God. And when you read the Quran, Quran speaks with dignity and reference about Nuh. Salamun ala Nuh fil alameen. About Ibrahim, Ibrahim Khalil al Rahman, Lut alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam. They left no one. No one. When it comes to Jesus, Jesus, I wish the Christians know and read what the Torah says about Jesus. They don't even recognize Jesus. They don't recognize him. They say Jesus is superstition. He didn't even exist. So this is what all, what other books say about the prophets. What we, we believe prophets are role models. They don't commit a sin. So this is regarding the prophets. When it comes to the common people like us, God has designated hidayah, guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yehdi bihillahu man ittaba'a ridwanahu subulat salam. Subul as-salam wa yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumat ila al-nur wa yahdihim ila siratin mustaqim. Now my friends, some parents always say, we work hard to protect our children. We are very serious to protect them. We speak with them. We, we maintain them very well. We are very nice with them. We try to bring them to the mosque. We try to, to send them to Saturday, Sunday school. We try to teach them the Quran, the Islamic manners. But yet, to no avail. Sometimes they go into the opposite direction. Why is that? Many mothers, many fathers, many grandfathers, they want their kids to follow the right path. But they say they don't listen. And they say we do everything, everything possible. Everything in our capacity to bring our kids to the path, to the right path. But they don't listen. What is the reason for that? What does God say about this? Mu'mineen, guidance and misguidance has reasons. Number one, let me say, let me say before I delve into this subject, complicated subject. For all those parents, for all those fathers and mothers, I have a message of hope. Do not give up on your children. Sometimes your children go through phases in their life. This phase could be two days, could be 20 days, could be two months, it could be two years, it could be 20 years. And I have seen example in my life. Parents who were struggling with their kids, with their sons and daughters for many decades. But then the son comes back, the daughter comes back. They come back. An example that I've seen in my life, someone renounced Islam, said, I'm not a Muslim. Run away from the family. Leave me alone. I hate Islam. Married 
a non-Muslim, moved from this country away from the family. After 10 years, that person came back. He said, I regret everything I did. Now I realize that what I missed. Now I realize that Islam is a beautiful religion. Now I realize that Islam is a merciful religion. I remember at that time, story goes to more than 20 years ago, the father was a crying. The father was a crying and I kept telling him, be patient, be patient. You have to have hope. You have to have hope in God. God is not going to leave you alone. God is going to come to your rescue. This is a phase. This person is going through some internal, internal upheaval in their lives. We don't know what is it. We don't know. Psychological, physical, mental. It happens. It happens. But I saw that, that person coming back, coming back to religion after leaving religion for 10 years, 10 full years. Now that person is one of the most religious and committed people in Islam. I saw this. So do not give up. Do not give up. These things happen. It happens to any family, anywhere in the world. It happens. It could happen to any person, any son, any daughter. But keep praying. Do not give up on God. Don't leave God. Go after God. Knock at his door. God says sometimes I want my servant to keep knocking and knocking and knocking. I will open the door. Eventually he says, he says I'm going to open that door. So why some of them do not listen? There are reasons my friends. One of the reasons is that the journey of guidance does not, does not begin at the age of 15 or 17 or 18. The journey of guidance, if we want our kids to be guided, to follow the right path, begins before marriage. Before marriage. I don't know whether I should mention this story or not. I don't know. Part of me says yes, part of me says no. There was a Muslim congressman. Now he's the attorney general of Minnesota. An African-American Muslim congressman. One time he saw me in a meeting. He came to me. He said, Imam Qazwini, I want to ask you a question. Yes. He said, what sort of dua your father did that all of his kids are serving Islam? This is exactly what he said. While he was wearing his shoes, believe me, he was putting on his shoes. We were inside the mosque while he was wearing it. And he was, I said, I really don't know. I don't know. I have to ask my father. A couple of months later, I went to Karbala. I was sitting with my father in his room. I said to him, daddy, this man, this congressman, is saying, what sort of dua you read? My father said, he said, before I got married, before my marriage, before I married your, your mother, he married at the age of 27. He said, before I married your mother, I would go every day, stand under the dome of Imam Hussein, and I cry, not just speak, with tears. This is exactly what he said. He said, with tears in my eyes, I saw, oh Allah, for the sake of this leader, Imam Hussein, I want my entire progeny and children to be the servants of Islam and Imam Hussein. He said, before I met your mother, before I married her, I don't have a wife. I didn't have money to get married. But I would ask Imam Allah every single day from the bottom of my heart, insist on God, please God, with tears, with tears. Have you seen state of distress? Amman yujibul muftar, muftar distress? He says, with this condition, I would pray. Definitely God is going to respond. When you send a, a, 
a, a distress message, even if you send it one time. Even if you send it one time, he will respond. If the message is sincere, he will respond. So the journey of guidance be begins before our marriage. If we want our kids to be guided, before I have to choose the right wife, the right husband, the right family, the right partner, the right mentor and teacher. Oftentimes, when we look for a wife, we focus on physical beauty. We don't check other aspects of her life. Is she going to be a mother, real mother, committed mother, honorable mother? If we are shopping for a husband, we, 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 look, we look for what? Huh? Maybe money, maybe something else. But are we going to say, is this man going to be a good father, caring father, responsible father for my kids? How many of us ask this question? We don't. We forget. We forget. So it begins from before. And then after marriage, my friends, the food you give to your children is important. The money you generate from the business, that money has to be pure and halal. That money should not be fraud. That money should not be stolen money, haram money. Allah said, Ya Musa, your community are begging me and praying, but tell them I'm not going to answer them. Musa said, why? Ilahi, look at them, they're crying. He said, yes, they are crying. The haram food, the haram money is in their stomach. I'm not going to answer their prayers. Tell them to clean their stomach first. Stop eating haram. I will answer them. The food you give your son, your daughter has to be halal. Be careful of the food. The source of the food. The source of the money. Where do you get this money from? Give them halal food. When you give them halal food, you don't worry about them later on. You don't have to run after them left and right. I, I've seen two brothers. There is a difference in their behavior, in their akhlaq, in their faith, in their manner. Because the mother with the first one was extra careful. Whenever she gives him food, milk, she would recite Quran and Dua. She didn't have the same condition with the second one. Now you see them different, subhanAllah different it is different my friends it makes a huge difference and then the intention intention most of us the parents when we pray for our kids we pray for their financial success oh god i want my son to go to the ivy league university and then after graduation he gets a good job multi-million dollar salary I want him to buy the biggest house. I want him to do the biggest thing. I want him to. How many of us like me, we say, oh God, I really want this son, this daughter to be dedicated to serve you, serve your cause, serve your religion, serve mankind, to be a servant. The mother of Mary, Hannah, the mother of Mary. In chapter 19, O God, I have dedicated whatever I am carrying in my tummy. At that time, they did not have this, uh, what they call it? Ultrasound. She didn't know. Boy, girl, she didn't know. But she said, whatever I am carrying... I am dedicating it muharrara. Muharrara means only to serve the temple, Baytul Maqdis. Only. I want my, my child to focus his entire energy and effort into focusing the mosque, the temple, Baytul Maqdis. And do nothing else. Muharrara. An absolute dedication to the cause of God. Fataqabbal minni. Look what God has given her. Mary, the mother of Jesus. The best lady. She's going to be with Lady Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam together. Together. <laughs> Zakaria alayhi salam, before he received Yahya, his son Yahya, what did he say? 
رب هب لي من لدنك ذرية طيبة. Always his dua. He didn't he didn't pray for money. He didn't say, Oh God, give me money. He said, God, if you give me children, I want them to be pure and kind. ذرية طيبة إنك سميع الدعاء. How many of us we pray and we say, Oh God, I want my son and my daughter to be the servant of Deen. Let him be a doctor, it's okay. An engineer, a businessman, it's okay. But at the same time, does not forget his religion. Does not forget mankind. Serves my, mankind. When he makes money, he says, I take a portion to myself to enjoy my life with my family, with my kids. The other portion, I give it to religion, to mankind. How many? How many, my friends? It all depends on our intention. For those who are still not married, this is my humble advice as a servant to you, as a servant. First of all, look for the right partner. Right partner does not mean he is the richest or she is the most beautiful. Look for the one who is the most virtuous, most loyal. Look for so someone who becomes a real mentor for your kids. A real father, a real mother, a caring person. We may spend our days and nights in hunger, in poverty. But we, we cannot afford losing our children. Don't lose your children. Look for such a partner. Sometimes we compromise our principles. We compromise our principles. When it comes to materialism, the bar is very high. But when it comes to religion, ethics, akhlaq, the bar is very low. And then after that intention, your intention, keep praying. Keep praying. Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyib. This is your asset. This is your asset. Let me conclude with this story of Isa alayhi salam. Some of you may have heard this story before. But it's very important. Isa was walking with his disciples in Palestine. He comes across a grave. He hears noises from that grave. He asks Allah, what's happening here in this grave? Allah says to him, Ya Isa, this man is a sinner. He is being punished inside his grave. Adab al-Qabr. Adab al-Qabr. Very few people escape that punishment. Very few. And then he came the following year. Ja'af al-Qabil, meaning the following year. He passed it through the same cemetery, the same grave. It was silent. Nothing comes out. He said, oh God, last year I went. I came with my disciples. This man was being tortured. Now we don't hear any voice. What happened to this man? God said to him, Ya Isa, إِنَّهُ قَدْ بَلَغَ لَهُ وَلَدٌ فَأَصْلَحَ طَرِيقًا وَأَعْوَى يَتِيمًا فَغَفَرْنَا لِلْأَبِ بِسَبَبِ عَمَلِ وَلَدِهِ O oh Isa, this time of the year, this man had a boy. This boy reached the age of responsibility and maturity, بلوغ. He decided, this boy, decided to pave the way in his village for people. Paving the way. He didn't build a mosque. Not a mosque. He paved the way. He paved the way and he sheltered an orphan. We decided to forgive the father in his grave because of the behavior and the deed of the son. They are your assets. Our children are our assets. In this life and in the hereafter. Your work is not wasted. Your kids are your capital, not your bank account. Your kids. Your kids, not your house, not your career, not your titles. Your kids are your real assets and real capital. And this is why God says to Prophet Muhammad, Inna a'tainaka al kawthar. This is the biggest gift of God. The Prophet lost his son, Abdullah. He was entering the Masjid al-Haram. One of Bani Umayyah stood there. He said, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الْأَبْتَرِ 
Muhammad came and he had no children because they always regarded the son as a real child. Daughter is not a real child. They didn't count her. She's nothing. But the son, the male. So when the son died and subhanallah, God went exactly the, the opposite of Quraysh, of what they believe. Quraysh always cherished the boys, always the boys. They disregarded the females. God was telling them, I am going to make Muhammad without boys, but with girls. And through one of these girls, he's going to have an abundance. An abundance of children. How many Sayyids we have here in this room now? How many? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. MashaAllah. Only in this room. They say, according to the latest surveys, 70 million Sayyids worldwide. 70 million. This is the gift that God presented the Prophet here in this life, in this life. And I hope we represent our grandfather Rasulullah. If not, we are the biggest losers, my friends. If we do not abide by the law, if we do not represent our grandfather Rasulullah, we will be the biggest losers. Biggest losers. One of them is Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. One of them is Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha alayhi salatu wassalam. Those are one of the grandchildren of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tonight, the little room of the Prophet, the little room of Fatima is dark. According to historians, the Prophet was buried either today, the 28th of Safar in the evening, or tomorrow, the 29th of Safar. And the suffering of Lady Fatima begins from today, when her father is buried. An endless suffering of Ahlul Bayt. And this is also a test. God is putting the Prophet into a test. Testing his will and his resolve and his faith and his commitment. The suffering of Lady Fatima begins when the Prophet is buried. She comes to his grave. Mada ala man shamma turbata ahmad. She takes a handful of dirt and she smells the dirt. She smells the shirt of the Prophet. When the Prophet died, Bilal, his muaddin, his muaddin, the one who raised the adhan for so many years, he decided to quit. He said, I'm going to quit. And then he moved to Syria, he, he left Medina. Then he came back after a period of time. He was in town. They came to him. They said to him, Ya Bilal, Fatima alayhi salam is longing to hear your voice because your voice is going to remind her of the time of her father, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, no, no, please, excuse me, I cannot. This is too much for me. I decided not to raise the adhan after the Prophet. They said, but this is the request of Lady Fatima. Honor her request. He said, okay, okay, if, if Lady Fatima is asking me, I will. So he went at the time of Adhan in the masjid. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. When he said, ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. <laughs> Lady Fatima cried with the loudest of her voice. He said, abatah, ya Rasulullah. We miss you, my father, Ya Rasulullah. We miss you. She passed out. They came to him. They said, Ya Bilal, Ya Bilal, stop your adhan. Fatima passed out. He said, Wallahi, I was fearing for this. This is why I refused. I knew what will happen to Fatima when, he, when she hears the name of her father, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Hassan at the time of his death, his brother Hussein came to him. He went into his room. He took his head. He put it in his lap. Imam Hassan removed his head. Imam Hussein said to him, Brother, let me keep your head. He said, No, brother. Brother Hassan, no. Because 
At the time of your death, nobody is going to hold your head. <laughs> Leave my head on the ground. I want to die the same way you're going to be murdered and die after me. Same thing happened to Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. At the time of his death in his room, he turned to one of his disciples, Abu al-Hart al-Salawi. He said to him, he said to him, remove the carpet, roll up this carpet and put me on the ground, on the floor. He said, why, Ibn Rasulullah? He said, لأنني أريد أن أموت كما مات جدي الحسين. I want to die the same way. My grandfather Hussein died on the ground of Karbala, on the plains of Karbala. أفاطم لو خلت الحسين مجدلا وقد مات عطشانا بشط فراتي إذا للطمت الخيط فاطم عنده وأجريت دمع العين في الوجنات أفاطم قومي يا ابنة الخير واندبي نجوم سماوات بأرض فلاتي قبور بكوفان وأخرى بطيبة وأخرى بفخ نالها صلواتي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين